I uh, uh, have nothing to declare about this uh, talk. Uh, we're going to be talking about radiation safety in the cath lab. Um, the only thing that I have to declare is that uh, I don't consider myself an expert on radiation safety. Um, when I was studying for the boards, uh, I read a number of different sources for radiation safety, found them all fairly confusing and a number of relatively disjointed topics. And I uh, got a little inspired to try to put this lecture together to uh, bring some organization to the whole thing. This, this is uh, a topic that definitely will come up on the interventional boards. And uh, there'll also probably be some questions on the uh, general board. So very good to, to know the basics of radiation safety. It's also good to know just for your own day-to-day um, uh, -day mindfulness of what you want to expose yourself to. We're talking about radiation safety in the cath lab. And of course, you know that radiation is a potentially dangerous thing. Um, it, I don't know if any of you are Star Trek aficionados, but radiation killed uh, Lieutenant Spock when he was uh, in the Wrath of Khan, one of the, the best full feature length movies of uh, that genre. Um, and there's a lot of myths and concerns about radiation, what it can do to you. People tend to over exaggerate and emphasize things. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, make some sense of the whole topic. Uh, Marie Curie said that nothing in life is to be feared, it is only to be understood. And she of course uh, discovered the element radium. So uh, first thing to do is to uh, figure out uh, what is radiation? So radiation is any electromagnetic light wave or high energy photon capable of producing ion pairs by interaction with matter. Uh, it could be particulate, and uh, we usually don't deal with that directly in the cath lab. Sometimes we do with if you're doing brachytherapy, but particles, uh, an alpha particle is two protons and two neutrons. The beta particle is a single high energy electron. The thing that we deal with the most in the cath lab is the gamma ray or the X-ray. And these are high energy light waves or photons. Uh, there's a difference between gamma rays and X-rays. Um, the gamma ray is a high energy light wave that's created as an atomic nucleus decays. So if it's in an unstable state and it starts to decay, gamma rays can be given off. An X-ray is a different type of thing. It's a, still a high energy photon, but it's emitted when orbital electrons fall back to a lower energy level. So if you excite an atom and the uh, electron goes to a higher energy state, that higher energy state can then fall back to the normal state. And when that happens, it's the energy that's given off is in an X-ray. And that's what we use in the cath lab. If you look at the uh, electromagnetic spectrum, uh, it's good to run through the whole thing. We, we have uh, radio waves that are down in the uh, long uh, wavelength type uh, spectrum. And these are lower frequency, long wave, or high, uh, lower, lower, long wavelength, uh, lower frequency waves. Our uh, beloved cell phones reside here in the uh, uh, megahertz and gigahertz range. Uh, you then move on to the infrared spectrum, pass through visible light, our Roy G. Biv uh, type of visible light on the uh, prism spectrum get into ultraviolet light, and we're moving up the energy uh, spectrum here as you get these shorter wavelength, higher frequency uh, light uh, waves, they become much higher energy. And then you finally get to uh, ionizing radiation, which are the shortest uh, wavelength, high, highest energy. And these are where the X-rays and gamma rays reside. Uh, 
you can find sources of radiation in nature. Uh, everyone is exposed to a little bit of radiation. The average is one to three millisieverts per year. You can get uh, radiation from medical procedures. Uh, you can get it if you fly air travel a lot. You get exposed to more high atmospheric uh, radiation waves if you travel high. Um, smoking, nuclear power, uh, smoke detectors around the home, radon gas, all of these natural sources uh, we are exposed to and give us an underlying baseline exposure to x-rays in our life. So very important thing to start out is how is radiation measured? I'm going to try to take us through the a little bit of historical view for that. Um, this is uh, Wilhelm Rentgen, and he discovered uh, radiation, uh, and his uh, name was given to the initial Rentgen. It's a unit of ionizing radiation that's required to produce a specified number of ion pairs from a specified volume of air. And initially, we used the, the word rad, a unit of radiation absorbed dose, rad. And that's the amount of radiation required to impart 100 ergs of energy to one gram of tissue. That, do, that term rad has been superseded by the gray, and that's the uh, SI units. And the gray is what we use nowadays to describe radiation dosing for uh, radiation therapy. And it can also be used in the cath lab. Uh, so gray is just a simple SI unit, it's a, and it's a unit of absorbed dose of energy of radiation. It's amount of radiation required to impart one joule of energy to one kilogram of tissue. Very metric oriented there, joules and kilograms. Um, we also have a different thing. This is an important concept uh, that comes up on the boards. There's a different description of dosing uh, when you talk about dose equivalent. And this unit is designed to measure the effect of radiation on a given biologic tissue. So the dose equivalent equals the absorbed dose or your dose in grays times a dimensionless factor that's specifying a tissue's risk for cancer induction. And that's the sievert. The sievert uh, is, is similar to gray, but it also it includes that dimensionless factor that uh, specifies the tissue's risk. And when we talk about exposure in the cath lab, the sievert is the unit that is used because of its biologic importance. The historical unit, when I was first starting in fellowship, we, we measured everything in REMS. And uh, it, it's this, you know, you have RADs, are related to gray. And here with the equivalent dose, you have the REMS are related to sievert. So one sievert is 100 REMS. So when in the, in the old days, we used to uh, measure our biologic exposure in millirems and our badges uh, measured in millirems. Some other terms, uh, you need uh, an energy uh, KEV, which is in the uh, x-ray tube, and that's just the measure of the voltage that's applied across the tube. So it's the kinetic energy gained by an electron accelerating through a one volt potential, and we set KV on our radiation machines. And there's also the peak skin dose that's measured in gray. That's the maximum dose delivered to any portion of a patient's skin during a fluoroscopic procedure. And then another uh, important concept is the dose area product. This is measured in grays times centimeters squared. Um, so it's the product of the air dose at a certain distance from the x-ray tube and the cross-sectional area of the X-ray beam at that same distance. So it's a uh, convenient surrogate for patient effective dose. And all of our rooms have uh, DAP meters in them. Now you can see if you go into our room, they're there in the uh, lower area. You can see there's DAPs 
measured in centigrade centimeters squared. So all of our rooms have these uh, descriptions for uh, patient dosing. So it's important to understand how the equipment uh, generates x-rays and where the active part of the uh, x-ray equipment is when we're in the room. So here's a very uh, simple setup. We have uh, the, the action all occurs in this x-ray tube, which is below the patient. Uh, that's hooked up to a high voltage generator and that spews out the x-rays that are hopefully going mostly through the patient um, and going up to this image intensifier, uh, which is just above the patient. Uh, that is the heart of the system that produces the x-rays. This is the bad thing. This is what causes x-rays to emit. And uh, you want to, in general, stay as far away from this tube as you can within reason. Once the image gets up to the image intensifier, it's converted into a, a video signal that we can actually see. And that's taken to a video camera. And then you go to all your you know, nice little uh, viewing monitors and freeze monitors, hard drives, digital storage, all that is taken from the video camera above the patient. If you actually look at what goes on in the x-ray tube, this is an important concept, concept of Bremsstrahlung. That is the German name of how x-rays are generated in our tube. So what happens is that the tube is made up of a tungsten disc, right? And that disc is the anode in the system. And you have a cathode that's accelerating electrons toward that tungsten disc. And what happens to each electron is that it'll, the tungsten nucleus, which is ridiculously anatomically heavy here, will veer the, the electrons off and they will break a little bit. And that extra energy is then converted into an X-ray photon. And that's emitted by the tube. This generates quite a bit of heat. Uh, so this tungsten disc is always spinning. Thus the, the noise that we always hear in the cath lab when the, when the tube is on. And uh, you know that also leads to things breaking down. Uh, when the tube gets too hot for too long a time, uh, eventually these things can easily wear out. But the key concept here is the issue of Bremsstrahlung or breaking, radi breaking radiation. And that is how X-rays from an X-ray tube are generated in the cath lab. So what happens when you get these uh, photons uh, revved up and, and going in the cath lab? So you have the tube, that is below the patient, the x-rays exit the tube and start to spread out and they hopefully go up and hit the image intensifier. We, we had uh, said that before. And if you look at what happens with each individual photon, there's three possibilities. An x-ray photon can actually just pass right through the uh, patient without any interaction at all. And that's that's an okay thing. It didn't hit any atoms. It didn't do anything. It uh, basically just passed through and hits the image intensifier tube. It may be right next to another X-ray photon that is totally absorbed by the patient. And this of course is what generates our image. We get a contrast between easily penetrating areas versus more dense areas. And that tends to uh, form an image. And uh, the one, the photon that is to totally absorbed, of course, also causes a patient dose. The worst photons are those that are those that uh, scatter. You know, the uh, if the photon goes into the patient or hits the table or hits anything as it traverses the uh, uh, air and that it, up towards the tube, it can just go in a completely different direction. 
Uh, it can leave some of its energy in the patient, so it does cause a patient dose, but this is what gets us in the cath lab. This scatter uh, will cause uh, a, a dosing of uh, the staff that's in the room. This scatter can go in any direction, and you know, you, you know that for, from interacting with just light in general, if you shine it onto something, it can bounce off of that and, and hit you. So that's what happens as they pass through the patient. So the next thing to consider is how does uh, how do these photons cause biologic damage to biologic tissue? And of course, it all happens in the DNA molecule. Uh, the effects of ionizing radiation on DNA are not good. Uh, it causes multiple problems with the molecule, and uh, that can lead to uh, mutations and dysfunction of the cell in general. Um, so that's, that's our target that is the unfortunate thing when we use x-rays. Uh, if you have your DNA that's hit, it absorbs this energy, and causes various base changes, cross linkage changes, problems with uh, uh, double strand breaks, all these things that can happen to your DNA. And what does that cause? The DNA can basically be damaged in two different ways. And these, these are important things for board questions. You have uh, photons that cause direct lethal damage to rapidly dividing cells. So if you have uh, photons that hit uh, GI endothelial cells, that can cause death of that cell from the uh, DNA interaction, and that can cause uh, gastroenteritis. You get, you get uh, a leakage of the mucosa of the GI tract, this can affect the bone marrow. You can affect uh, the skin is rapidly dividing, so you can get radiation dermatitis. And all of this is the key word, deterministic effects. These are uh, directly lethal effects from the radiation bombarding the DNA of rapidly dividing cells. The long-term effect is a different thing. These are called stochastic effects. And this is what causes issues down the road. So you have the potential for birth defects, mutations, increased risk of cancer, and genetic disorders in future generations. And this is a different type of injury. So the, it's important to know the difference between the two. Stochastic effects involves chance and probability. Uh, the severity of injury is independent from the radiation dose. You Theoretically, you could receive one strategically placed photon that will damage your DNA and cause a mutation that can cause either cancer or a birth defect or a mutation in future lineage. There's a nonlinear threshold model. So uh, the probability of injury increases with the dose, but it is never at zero. And usually stochastic effects occur years and decades after your exposure to the radiation. This is opposed to deterministic effects, which uh, result from uh, radiation damage leading to cell death. And this usually occurs just a few days or weeks after exposure to the radiation. So uh, there's been a lot of work done uh, determining this linear non-threshold model by looking at different populations. So we have uh, people who have been exposed to uh, radiation over the years at various dosing, and they've been studied very carefully for development of, of tumors in particular. And um, you can plot this stuff out on a uh, line of the nonlinear threshold effect. And by putting the uh, patient's data for cancer risk uh, and plotting the, the uh, deaths as exposed to dose, you can extrapolate a line that will give you a relative probability of your uh, chance of cancer for a given dose. 
So I just wanted to show some uh, unfortunate uh, views here of what can happen. Um, this photo was taken uh, in the Chernobyl area in the late 80s and 90s. A, a photographer was going around to the various farms in the after the Chernobyl disaster, and they noticed a, a much higher increase of mutations and birth defects that occurred in animals in this area because of exposure to uh, the uh, uh, radiation that was released in the Chernobyl disaster. This is a uh, stochastic effect. This is a mutation. Uh, this is not uh, direct injury from the radiation. So this occurred with this calf who was born several years later uh, and presumably developed this birth defect due to the stochastic effects of radiation exposure. This is the same Chernobyl uh, uh, view. This is downwind of Chernobyl. Chernobyl was here, and this is a few weeks after the uh, disaster. I think we lost Dr. Remitz there. Can you hear me, Karthik? Yes, I can hear you. I don't know why my uh, my Zoom uh, quit here. I don't know why that. Okay. Let me try to get things back up. We good there? Can you see see everything? Yes, I can. Yep. All right, so we were talking about uh, stochastic and deterministic effects. Uh, this is an unfortunate patient who had a, a prolonged radiation procedure, a prolonged cath procedure, who got terrible uh, skin desquamation due to high skin dose from the tube. And this is, of course, a deterministic effect. This is the most common deterministic effect that we see in the cath lab. Um, uh, and important to know a little bit about uh, radiation dermatitis and the effects on the skin. And this is Alexander Lekovinyeko, who was also uh, uh, murdered uh, allegedly by the KGB with uh, polonium isotopes uh, that was put in his tea. He was a KGB agent and unfortunately succumbed to uh, um, uh, poisoning by polonium. So if we look at this, we can actually uh, figure out a risk and chance of developing cancer post-radiation exposure. So it's estimated that uh, uh, five to ten percent of uh, for, there's a, a five to ten percent risk of cancer. 
answer for every sievert of exposure. So uh, it's important to keep in mind that uh, one sievert is a huge exposure. Uh, it's equivalent to uh, very high levels in, from the cath lab. 50 millisieverts is the maximal yearly uh, recommended exposure for 20 years. So that's a very high uh, uh, dose of uh, radiation. Um, so if, it's, if the chance of cancer is 5% per sievert exposure, you have um, uh, 0.05 per sievert. Uh, that's the probability. So one in a, or five in a hundred. Um, I, mean, I converted this to REMS because we used to have our badges in REMS, but you could do the same thing with sieverts nowadays. So um, uh, it's a five per 10,000 risk of uh, developing a cancer related to the radiation. If you look at the lifetime risk of cancer for any person, it's around 30%. And so the additional cancers that you would get from a sievert exposure would be five per 10,000 people. So if you have a control population that gets 3,000 cancers per 10,000 people, if you had exposed another population to one sievert, you would, or one REM, you would get an exposure of uh, 3,005 cancers. So that, that kind of gives you a perspective of how many additional cancers you're, you're gaining, you know, five out of 3,000. This is uh, an old view of our uh, radiation exposure, and this is a, uh, one of our senior operators who, over the course of 13 years was exposed to uh, 5,000 millirems. And this is, uh, this is, you know, surface radiation. So this does not include the uh, uh, lead uh, protection that this operator would get. So if you have 5,000 uh, rems or five rems for lifetime exposure, uh, that's 50 millisieverts. You have two millisieverts per year and this additional cancer risk uh, calculates out to 2.5 per thousand people for extra cancer risk. So again, just keeping that in perspective of uh, what can happen in the cath lab. And uh, these are tend to be important numbers. They tend to show up on boards. The recommended maximal yearly occupational exposure, we already talked about this at 50 millisieverts. A recommended maximal lifetime exposure is 10 millisieverts times your age in years. And uh, important to have a general knowledge of these, these numbers. So, you know, if you look around, we're all dealing with risks uh, in our society, uh, cigarettes, smoking, drinking, polluted water, uh, peanut butter, anything that you come in contact with uh, can, can generally impart some type of risk. You know, a biking accident, if you go 10 miles uh, riding a bike, there's a risk of accident. There's a, a one in a million risk from eating 100 charcoal steaks because of all the uh, benzopyrenes that you pick up uh, and consume. So you have to keep all these things in perspective uh, with the, our, our little friendly radiation doses up here, two millirems of radiation exposure will lead to one in a million risk of cancer. And of course you could uh, compute days of life lost. If you're a smoker, you, you're up in the thousands for days of life lost, overweight, 850 days lost. Uh, all accidents, uh, 400 days lost. If you drink on a consistent basis, you lose a few days. And uh, if you get one rem per year for 30 years, you lose 30 days of life. So important to keep these things in perspective. Relatively low risk for this type of thing. So we want to review uh, deterministic effects that occur in the cath lab. And for that, uh, we, we need to talk a little bit about skin injury. So most deterministic injury from the cath lab is to the skin. 
the majority of radiation is absorbed at the patient's skin level, and uh, the greatest radiation scatter is also at the skin level. So important to keep these things in mind. Um, this chart lists uh, the dose of the uh, to the skin in milligrays, and uh, we're going from lowest dose here, less than 2,000 milligrays, up to the highest dose, which is 15, you know, over 15,000 milligrays. This is a, an insanely high dose from, from cath lab exposure. Um, and you progress to where if you have a two to 5,000 milligray exposure, the skin can become reddened. Uh, sometimes there's epilation in a few weeks. Uh, usually this type of thing recovers very well and there's no long-term effects. Uh, as you progress to the more serious things, uh, the uh, high dose radiation will give you uh, both erythema and then eventually ulcers and desquamation. And this can be a horrible uh, thing to happen. The patients can get long-term uh, non-healing ulcers if uh, they get very high skin exposure in the cath lab. There are other effects. We, we almost never see these things, uh, pericarditis, uh, but we do see transient erythema and epilation, which is in the 200 to 300 grad range. Uh, so important to keep this in mind. These are some examples of uh, uh, skin injury. This is a patient who had transient erythema from a procedure. And this is what I, I have not seen any of these. This is, you know, again, like 35 years of being in the cath lab. I've only heard about injuries like these over here. I have seen this. Uh, this, you will come across patients that, you know, a week or two, they come back for their post cath follow up and they'll have a well. Uh, circumscribed area of uh, erythema in a in a port that was used for uh, imaging the heart, uh, and and sometimes these can even be in an actual square where they'll have a very well circumscribed area, and they can be uncomfortable. Patients will describe a sunburn or an itchiness in these areas. These other injuries, uh, we just have to keep in mind that you want to try to avoid them. I mean. Uh, this unfortunate woman here was, uh, you know, in a 10-hour ablation, and she was thought to have between 15 and 20 gray exposure, and the tube, this was done from a lateral position, so the tube was very close to her right arm. So uh, you got to really think about this when you want the tube to remain as far as possible uh, from these patients to try to avoid this type of thing. The closer the tube gets, the worse things off will be. So it's an important concept to vary views when you have a prolonged case. Uh, you want to, you know, if you're in an LAO projection, you might go a little less steep uh, during some of the procedure to avoid prolonged uh, uh, exposure of the skin to the high dose uh, radiation in a single view. Um, we should talk a little bit about radiation induced cataracts. This uh, information comes from survivors of atomic bombs uh, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, you know, there are, there's a debate in the community about whether there's a threshold effect. Uh, this does seem to suggest some type of threshold at one to two grays for high exposure. Um, so uh, it is not a, uh, a stochastic effect. This is a, a deterministic effect. Uh, and uh, you, you certainly want to try to avoid uh, this type of thing by protecting your eyes. But you also have to keep in mind that cataracts come from other things. Uh, if you are exposed to outdoor uh, UV sunlight, uh, farmers and airline pilots tend to get a higher risk of cataracts. Glass blowers, uh, if you're around microwaves quite a bit, uh, that can cause cataracts. So uh, you want to keep this in mind that all of these things can contribute to cataract development. Uh, they did some in, some um, experiments with the NASA astronauts who uh, they had a tremendous amount of radiation exposure 
uh, and they, or they, they had a tremendous amount of information on their radiation exposure because all of them wear badges and they have an exact uh, knowledge of what exposure the astronauts had. And there were low dose and high dose astronauts and those that had greater than eight millisieverts did seem to develop a higher incidence of cataracts as they aged that was greater than the uh, low dose astronauts. So, uh, you know, reasonable information that suggests that uh, there is a certain risk of cataract formation in the cat body. Important thing to, to remember, just use common sense. You want to wear leaded glasses when you're in the lab. And you also want to protect yourself when you're outside. Uh, you, you know, UV filtering sunglasses uh, when you're exposed to uh, sunlight, it's always a good practice to try to wear your sunglasses so you'll minimize your chance of cataracts. Another topic that uh, comes up is uh, pregnancy in the camp lab. Um, uh, it, uh, you know, because we're all developing our family life, uh, this eventually becomes a topic for uh, female operators in the cath lab. It also will become a topic uh, for, for males. Uh, if, you're, if you're trying to get to have a family, males can also carry genetic damage. Most of this information comes from mice data. We really had the, the most, the experiments were interesting. They did, you know, these millions of mice where they look to see how mutations are passed from one generation to the next and how birth defects develop. And there was a, a couple key concepts. Uh, the mutations differ significantly at the rate at which they are produced by a given dose. There is a substantial dose effect with no threshold for mutation production. So, uh, you know, there is no threshold. These are true stochastic effects. Um, the male is also radio sensitive. Uh, and actually in these experiments seem to be more radio sensitive than the male and they carried a lot of uh, radiation induced genetic burden. So you have to think about that if you're starting a family when you're in the cath lab to try to always protect yourself. And the genetic consequences of radiation dose can be greatly reduced by extending the time interval between the radiation exposure and conception. If you can, it's good to kind of try for six months to a year between your radiation exposure and, and conception. And the amount of radiation required to double the natural and spontaneous mutation rate is, is really high, you know, 20 to 200 rads is estimated. So, uh, you know, you're talking about, again, a relatively low risk for the type of exposure that we get in the cath lab. This is a kind of a complex chart, but it's important. And the, the point here that we were trying to, I was trying to make was that the relative incidence of uh, fetal problems that occur uh, with radiation exposure are very dependent on gestational age. So in the first trimester, when all the action for organ system is developing, you get a much higher incidence of, of fetal problems. So prenatal death, congenital abnormalities, neonatal death, leukemia, all those things are much higher. The, fetus is exposed early in the pregnancy. And later on in the pregnancy, in the second and third trimester, the, the fetus becomes more radio resistant. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you can, the, the critical time to be out of the lab is usually in that first trimester to minimize exposure during the first trimester. So if you look at the same type of calculations we did before, uh, the risk chance of passing on a birth defect post radiation exposure, one per 10,000 for every millisievert of exposure and uh, childhood cancers, six per 100,000 for every millisievert of uh, radiation exposure. So again, low but measurable risk uh, of birth defects in childhood cancers when the fetus is exposed. So, uh, you know, we come up with guidelines for uh, 
pregnant cath lab personnel. We have to respect the rights of the expectant mother to pursue her career without discrimination based on gender. You want to protect the fetus, and we also have to consider the needs of the employer. Uh, usually in the cath lab for uh, hospital personnel, uh, if, they, if the person wants to get another job where they aren't exposed uh, for the cath lab when they're pregnant, that's easily accomplished. Um, the uh, NCRP guidelines for total expe fetal exposure should be less than five millisieverts for the total pregnancy. And uh, so... The monthly exposure should not be over a half a millisievert per month. And of course, we already covered the lower risk when your exposure is later in the pregnancy. So th this is really important stuff. We're going to kind of get into the meat of, you know, how to protect yourself in the cath lab. So these are really important concepts. And these, again, tend to show up on boards. Uh, the concept of the LARA is, is uh, uh, as low as reasonably achievable. That's what we're going for in cath lab radiation exposure. So uh, the inverse square law is an important concept. The idea that uh, light, as it gets further away from its source, exponentially decreases in its uh, dosing. So if you're at this one meter zone, uh, you would uh, have uh, an exposure of, of uh, that's four times higher than if you're two meters away. So just by doubling the dose, you get a four time reduction in or do by doubling the distance from the source, you're getting a four times reduction in exposure to x-ray. So very important concept, inverse square law, exponential decrease in dose with distance from the tube. So you always want to stand back as far as you can. Certainly, we want to minimize our chance of getting uh, exposed to the fluoro or cine. So uh, you don't want to have a heavy foot. You don't want to be on the uh, uh, image all the time. Uh, you can take a quick image and then bring up the freezes and do pre-planning. You certainly want to avoid redundant views. You know, you don't have to take a thousand shots. Once you have the uh, required in diagnostic information, you should think about cutting back and uh, moving ahead with your, your um, uh, therapy and try to avoid any further flora or cine. Um, there are um, uh, time alarms that occur when you're on fluoro. There's a five minute time notification that alarm should go off once you hit the five minutes. You wanna take uh, short looks with last image hold. The uh, approach generally matters. Now this in, in uh, 2022 translates into uh, radial versus femoral. You can generally get less exposure when you're doing the femoral approach. You tend to be standing further down the table. I, I don't know if this still holds up because we tend to have the radial cases uh, designed like femoral cases. So we're usually having the arm at the side and we're standing around the same place. But keep in mind that uh, you know, in the old data for brachial approach, it was uh, a higher dose to the operator when you did an arm versus leg. Certainly the uh, distance that the x-ray travels through the patient has a, an incredible effect on dose. If you increase the patient thickness by only a few centimeters, you can go up uh, in dosing of, of almost 600%. So you've got to remember that when you get a particularly heavy patient with an angulated view, your system, the, the x-ray system is going to automatically ramp up. So this is, uh, uh, the, there's the, the KVP or the energy that goes into that system and the, the amount of radiation that comes out in exposure is going to dramatically increase as you increase the uh, thickness of the patient or the angulation of the view. So that's an important thing to remember. 
And remember that uh, heavier patients also will increase the scatter uh, during that. So you want to, if, you, if at all possible, you want to try to avoid those angulated views through a lot of tissue in the patient. Um, here's another important thing about the uh, issue of uh, air gaps in the system. If you look over here, uh, this patient is far away from the tube and the image intensifier is very low. And this will give the patient a, a one dose. If you reduce the height of the table, the patient starts to get a much higher dose because they're, they're closer to the tube uh, so you increase the dose almost by 50%. The worst scenario is to have a low table and a high image intensifier. This causes the system to ramp up tremendously in the energy to get a good image, and that will uh, cause uh, you know, a very high increase in, in the patient dose. This also translates into uh, operator uh, dosing uh, changes so because of increased scatter. So you always want to keep the image intensifier as low as possible and the patient as, as the table as high as feasible to avoid uh, uh, extra exposure to the patient. This is kind of a uh, showing a representation of what the light would look like in these different circumstances. This with the high image intensifier, you, you could see that both the patient and the operator are getting extra exposure. And then if you bring the II down, the uh, exposures are reduced and relative. Of course, want to keep everyone away from the tube. Uh, we talked about the inverse square law. It applies to both the patient and the operator. And we already showed that one unfortunate patient who had a very bad burn because the tube was so close to her right arm. So, you know, keep that in mind when you're going into funny views. You don't want to get the tube too close to the patient. Shielding is, of course, a uh, really good idea. We all have shields that are in the lab. Uh, every lab has a shield that can be placed between you and the image intensifier and the patient. And it, this just gives a representation of you know, blocking a significant amount of the scatter and x-ray exposure when you have your shield in proper place. Uh, lead, of course, is important. Uh, with uh, modern day lead, you can usually get very good uh, reductions in uh, uh, radiation exposure. So, um, you know, almost 99% of the uh, exposures can be blocked by uh, lead. So very important to wear your lead at all times, wear your thyroid shield, keep your uh, eyes covered with leaded glasses. And, you know, a really important thing is, is your hands. I mean, I cringe a lot of times in the cath lab when I see, you know, fellows exposing their hands to the floral beam. This is almost like it should almost never happen. You shouldn't have to take a floral with your hand in the beam. Um, so uh, you, you would want to avoid this uh, if at all possible. You know, with ultrasound guidance, we really should be getting access without having your hand ever get in the beam. So, uh, and you, you should be able to maneuver that wire without taking a look at it when it's right over your hand. So please keep this in mind. You only want to place your hands on top of the patient if you should have to get them in the beam. You never want to uh, place your hands on the, uh, below the patient or closer to the tube. That'll give you a much higher exposure. And you want to, if you really are into fluoro in your hands, you can consider using leaded gloves. But these almost are never done in the cath lab because we have to keep a reasonable sense of dexterity. This is kind of an interesting uh, set of graphs which show that um, certain views are, are worse. Uh, this, these uh, rings here are different levels of exposure. This is a 25 exposure and a uh, uh, 150 exposure, 200. These show that um, when you get the tube in a view that's close to you, this is actually the operator dosing in these uh, views, 
the lowest exposure occurs when you're just in kind of shallow angulations with the tube far away from you. So the 10 degree REO, usually the tube is right under the patient, tends to be far away from the operator. So if you're standing down on the uh, lower right of the patient, you get a relatively limited exposure as opposed to a cranial uh, LAO, which uh, the tube is right under your feet and uh, the uh, exposure becomes much greater to the operator. So you got to keep that in mind uh, with these views. The cranial LAO is, is one of the uh, worst for operator exposure because the tube is so relatively close. You have to wear your badges, of course, to understand how, what exposure you're getting. Um, all of our badges now are, um, you can sign on to uh, the, uh, uh, you know, use your smartphone to get an app to sign on to the uh, uh, monitoring station. These they are automatically uh, uploaded uh, in the cath lab. So you can uh, push a button on the badge to uh, uh, upload to the system. And these are, are kept and you can, if you sign up for the uh, app, you can get your own exposure in this manner. And this is the guideline for uh, wearing badges. If you wear two badges, you want one on the outside of your thyroid collar and then at your waist level under your apron. If you wear one badge, it's supposed to be on the outside of the thyroid collar. So, um, Keep in mind that uh, fluoro gives you less exposure than uh, Cine, um, so uh, you want to try to limit your Cine runs. We always use pulse fluoro now, so usually it's a 10 millisecond frame. You can actually, if you want to, you can decrease the frame rate. There's a, a decreasing uh, or a problem with decreasing the frame rate. Your eyes tend to dislike uh, you know, viewing a movie when it's at a particularly slow frame rate. So uh, usually we keep this around uh, 15 or so. If you get too slow, you tend to lose the ability to uh, put things together. You certainly want to cut up the size of the beam to only focus on what you want to look at. And you want to try to avoid extremely magnified views. The, the patient and the operators will get higher dosing when, they, when you have a magnified view. This is a skin dose uh, related to fluoroscopic time. You know, no big surprise here. Most patients are down in the lower area. Occasionally we get uh, uh, you know, patients that get you know, 80 to uh, even 100 minutes of fluoro time and their skin doses go way up. This is, remember our pictures when you're starting to get into this range of 4,000, 5,000 milligrays, you're gonna have a uh, problem where you'll uh, start getting a significant skin injury. So you wanna really try to limit that, that fluoro time. And uh, this is the same thing for DAP meters. It's always good to see if you had a lot of fluoro time to, to look at the DAP meter for the, the patient exposure. Um, and uh, here the excessive exposures would be um, uh, 2000 milligrays when your DAP meter is reading about uh, you know, 30,000 or so. So important to uh, keep this in mind. And uh, this is all recorded in each cath lab blog. Uh, we record the DAP exposure for each uh, patient when they when they're done their cath lab, cath lab experience. The other thing to consider is that you know we we order a lot of uh, CTAs these days, and uh, uh, you know you get a, a patient exposure from CTAs, so uh, you have to keep that in mind from the patient's sake. Uh, you know, a, a 64 slice coronary CTA is going to give the patient an 11 millisievert dose. Um, your average exposure from a coronary angiogram would be uh, five millisieverts. Um, if you get a PTA and stent, your patient exposure is 10 millisieverts. So uh, this compares to the maximal yearly occupational exposure. We already went over that of 50. Um, so, uh, 
you know, each, each CTA is hmm, a lot of deterministic problems there. Um, each CTA is going to be worth five operator years in the cath lab. So important to keep that in mind when you're ordering diagnostic testing. So uh, these are the guidelines for occupational exposure. We've kind of covered this. Uh, the maximal yearly ex occupational exposure is 50 millisieverts. We, the yearly exposure, two millisieverts and your lifetime exposure is 10 millisieverts uh, times your age in years. These numbers are, are board related. They tend to come up on the boards. And uh, this is just some information that we accumulated uh, from some of our average Yale cases. Um, uh, if you go for average diagnostic study, the DAP average is usually around 7,000 with uh, four point, or, you know, about five, uh, minutes of fluoro time. As you run up the exposure uh, routine PCI, uh, not too much more exposure, just a little bit higher uh, with 17 minutes of fluoro time. Uh, leg cases tend to be particularly gruesome. And then the worst, of course, are total occlusion cases where you're getting up to, uh, you know, maybe even an hour of fluoro time. So you get very high exposures with this. So there, this is just a, a representation of total occlusion cases where showing that, you know, you tend to really have high uh, exposures. If you, you know, you should keep this in mind when you're doing a CTO case because you want to try to uh, vary the views, try to limit the fluoro time and kind of know when to quit. So that's all I have. Uh, can, can take any questions if you want. I uh, hope this was helpful for you. And uh, again, good good for a board review. Thank you so much, Dr. Remes. That was a great review of, uh, of radiation and uh, you know its importance and how to protect in the cat lab. Um, and also, you know, as you may have noted, there's a lot of new technology, and you know, there's a hot space uh, for new you know cat lab radiation protection systems and you know I came across uh, quite a few I don't know if, if any of those seem interesting to you there's the the Protego and the Rampart uh, lead shielding systems which are you know sort of like extensive shields which sort of protect all the members in the cath lab um, you know there's also this weightless aprons uh, these days which which are really popular at the, the conferences uh, I think Biotronic has it just like a zero gravity where your lead sort of gets suspended from the ceiling. There's a lot of technology uh, coming up and even, uh, you know, lighter leads with uh, leadless core materials, you know, are coming out. And, and if you don't want any of that, you can be outside and work on the robot, uh, right? We've got the Corindus robot now, which sounds promising. Uh, I also came across uh, a hand cream that people are using for folks that uh, are, you know, their hands are all the time in, in the x-ray, like TV procedures. And, you know, that's something that I, I wonder if, uh, you know, we can introduce in our lab as well, because, you know, a lot of the TV procedures use a lot of uh, radiation on the hands because, you know, they're trying to work the axis and, and move the equipment as the NDII is right there. Um, I, don't so, know if, I don't know if leaded hand cream sounds like a good idea, but <laughs> well, it's it's on the glove. I don't think you put, yeah. put it on uh, put it on the hand. I think you can put it sandwich it between gloves uh, or put it externally as well. I don't know if you have any thoughts about you know all these new technologies and and maybe you know ten years down the road we'll have that in our lab too. I think Beaumont Health, Beaumont and, and a few other places have started using. Uh, you know, this lead shielding system and looks, and you don't have to wear lead. I mean, the whole, the patient is sort of split in half and everything is leaded away. So, uh, you know, all that sounds great for the future. So for like potential aspirants who want to do interventional, you know, although we already have uh, radiation levels, which are much lower than when you were training, it's bound to get even lower, um, you know, for the new generation of trainees. Uh, 
Yeah, all good points. I mean, this all becomes a balancing act between expense and protection and feasibility. You know, do you if you if you kind of protect yourself really well, but you can't do the procedure, uh, you know, that leads to increased time. So it's it's all a real careful balance. But the new technologies are certainly uh, very exciting. All right, awesome. We have past the hour. Thank you so much, Dr. Reynolds. Okay. We'll see you again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.